Welcome in to session four of Creation, Distortion, and Redemption. We're going to begin a new section today talking about distortion. Before we go there, I want to remind you that you're not supposed to just be watching these videos and getting the information, but there's supposed to be interaction. One, there's supposed to be some Interaction between you and God in the daily Bible readings, the scripture memorization and meditation. I hope that you're doing that each week. And then also there's supposed to be some interaction with some other men. I hope that you're meeting together with some other guys. You're talking about some of those uh, devotional times that you're having with the Lord. You're challenging one another to memorize the verses, all of the information, the links that you need, the handouts. All of that is provided for you in the comments section, so make sure that you're staying on track with those things as well. That Remember, the, the very first session we talked about, it is so important to be a man who hears from God and does what God's calling him to do. So I, I hope these sessions have been a blessing to you, especially in that creation se section as you're learning why God made you, how God made you. I, I hope you're starting to see the concepts of responsibility that you have as a man. You're seeing the, the concept of, hey, this is my garden. This is my life that I have right now, and I am where I am. God has me where I am, and I need to do His will, and I need to get to work. And, and, and so I hope those things are beginning to make sense to you. And boy, when we get into this section right here, I think some more lights are going to start to come on and help you understand why we are the way we are. I hope this will help you to become more self-aware as a man, make you more open to redemption in your life, and really just kind of help you understand the struggle of the day-to-day. -day. Hey, guys, it's not just you. It's all of us. We all live in this mess of distortion that sin has caused. So let, let's get into this. So let's think about a situation in your life. It may be a team. It may be an organization. maybe may be where you work. maybe may be your church. And man, things were going really, really well until they weren't, right? So, so think, about, think about a situation like that. Man, it was going really, really well until it didn't go well. And maybe, I don't know, you, you didn't have a whole lot of rules and regulations or, or different things that you had to do, but somebody kind of took advantage of a situation or they didn't do what they were supposed to do or they caused harm to somebody else. And then because of that, everybody else suffers. And here comes a whole new list of policy changes that say, hey, here's how you're going to behave now that this has happened, right? You, can you think of a situation like that? I think we probably all can. I'm thinking about the Southern Baptist Convention, which I'm a, a part of in the church that I pastor right now. Been a lot of abuse by pastors and leaders, and so here comes a lot of different things that we're voting on and policies and oversight and all this kind of things because it was going really, really well, and then everybody found out it wasn't, right? And so... You have to bring in new rules that are hopefully redemptive measures that show how you're going to begin to operate now that people have begun to do the wrong thing. That happens on teams. That happens in organizations. That happens in churches. That happens in families. That's happened in the world. That's exactly what we're going to look at as we begin to look at this section on distortion. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3, and we're talking about the curse. So if you want to go ahead and get your Bible and open it over there to Genesis chapter 3, here's a really good example of how things were going really, really well until they weren't. Man, it all kind of messed up, right? So man and woman were enjoying oneness with God and with each other in a life-giving creation. That God was showing providential potential and giving them the ability to be fruitful and to multiply. And then Adam and the woman sinned. The relationship changed, and so do the policies, right? We're especially going to talk about that in the redemption section at the end of this study. So let's start to... To, uh, to open this up, to kind of unpack this section of distortion. So 
Here's some things that you're going to see in this session as we look at Genesis chapter 3, especially the curses that sin has brought into the world. Sin has brought distortion into man's relationship with God, with woman, and with creation. And then I'm going to kind of show one of these policy changes that we're going to get more into in that section on redemption. So get your Bible open, get your notes ready. Here we go. Sin has distorted man's relationship with God. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. And you you saw in Genesis chapter 2, things were going really, really well. And, and one of the things that we have implied there is that man and God spent time together. You We see the intimacy of the creation, that God didn't just speak man into existence, but he created him with his hands. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We see an intimacy in the relationship between man and God. We remember in Genesis chapter 2 that God brought all the animals in, in front of Adam. He paraded them in front of him, and Adam spent time naming the animals. And that's when he realized, hey, there's not a helper fit for me, you know? So God goes and he puts Adam to sleep. So we see just a lot of interaction between God and man in Genesis chapter 2. And then Genesis chapter 3, we have the sin story in the first seven verses. And then listen to verse 8. It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The idea that they heard the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, right? Is is an implicate it, it implies that that God comes to them in the best part of the day. This is this is kind of a time that that they would have with the Lord to talk to the Creator about the creation, how He made it, what they could learn, how they could develop it. Man, what great information they could get from the Lord in the work that he gave them to do as his images. But instead of spending that time with the Lord, they go and hide, right? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God as, as he walked into the garden. So, man, we we see that this idea of God coming to man in the cool of the day, things are going very well. And then we see that in sin, man hiding from God, it's not going very well. Another thing that, that we begin to see is that in Genesis chapter 2, Adam praises God for the woman. But when God asked the question, he said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I'm naked. I hid myself. You see the relationship between him and God has changed. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I command you not to eat? And Adam, who praised God for the woman in Genesis chapter 2, the man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. So ultimately, instead of now praising God for her, he blames God for her. The relationship between man and God has really changed. And as guys, I want you to think about a couple of things. I want you to think about when life is not going very well and, and the blame game that, that we play. Maybe you blame people at your work. Maybe you blame people in your family. Maybe you blame your wife. But when a man really gets down, who does he blame? And you blame God. Why is my life like this? Why are things going on with me like this? You, you do exactly what you see the first man do. That's what sin does to us. Instead of taking responsibility, man, we start passing blame. We we keep secrets from God. I hid myself. I was afraid of you. I'm, and think about how often that happens in a man's life. We we don't. Whenever we fall away, we get away from church. We get away from the Word. We get away from prayer. Why is that? Not because we've lost the habits. Because man, we just we're afraid. We're we're afraid to really deal with what's going on in our lives and to let the Lord in there and, and for Him to begin His good work in us. We'd rather stay hidden than to spend the best time of our day with God. And Listen, guys, we all make excuses. How's that devotional time going? Well, I don't have time. Or I, 
I don't understand the Bible or I this or I that. That's it. That's the same thing Adam was doing in going into hiding. You, you can put all those bushes out there. I don't understand it. I don't have the time. I don't can't do this or I can't do that. Man, all those are just bushes that you're going behind and hiding your shame. And, and, and so we need to understand as men, there's God still wants to spend the best part of the day with us. He wants to come walking to us in the cool of the day. But instead of us going off and hiding, man, we need to reserve that time to come out of hiding in a confessional life before the Lord and spend that devotional time with Him. There's so much we could learn about the way He has created the world and how we can develop it and how, how we can can be those images of God that He created us to be. So this is the life of man in distortion. He plays a game of hiding with the Lord. We've lost something of our relationship with God, that intimacy that He wants to have with us. And so understanding this opens us up to the redemption that God has for us in Christ Jesus, that intimacy He wants to bring back into our lives. But understand this, first of all, guys, sin has distorted your relationship with God. Now let's talk about how sin has distorted your relationship with women. So remember in Genesis chapter 2, the woman was brought to the man to solve something in creation that wasn't good. Man was alone. And so God made from the man a helper fit for him. That's the language we read in Genesis chapter 2. Now, here we go into distortion. And when we read the curses that are pronounced because of what sin has brought into the world, here we have one of those misunderstood phrases in Genesis chapter 3, 16. It says, To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you'll bring forth children. And here's the phrase we, we misunderstand. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. The misunderstanding comes when you see that as the policy change, the men ruling over the women. Guys, this is not the policy change. What God is doing is showing you the problem. Now, all of a sudden, the helper that was fit for him, there's going to be division. There's going to be rivalry between them. The, the phrase, your desire, talking to the woman, your desire shall be contrary to your husband or your desire shall be for your husband or toward your husband, depending on, on what translation you read. To, to understand that phrase, you really got to go into Genesis chapter 4, which provides a great commentary for it, where Cain, his remember, his face has fallen. He's angry because God hasn't accepted his sacrifice. We're going to talk about this more uh, next week in our session. But remember what the Lord said to Cain? Sin is, is crouching for you. It's, it's hiding. It's about to overtake you. And he says, its desire is for you. The, the phrase there doesn't mean that the woman is just going to need a man. What it's saying there is, is her, her, it's not going to be her desire to help him. It's going to be her desire to overcome him. She, she's always, instead of being his helper, she wants to be his overcomer. And so this is the problem now that we see between men and women. So this, this idea for the man, he's going to, he will rule over you. He's going to use that physical strength and that dominance that he has. And, and instead of working with her, instead of being responsible for the relationship, remember the idea of responsibility? It's not responsibility anymore. It's just rule, man. I'm going to put her desire to overcome me. I'm going to put it down, and I'm going to win at all costs, and I'm going to overcome her. And so now, instead of this wonderful relationship that man had with the woman that solved a massive problem of something missing in creation, now you have this wrestling that's going on between them. Man, we've, we, we've, we're, we're in a huge problem here. And so Here's one of those light bulb moments, guys. How do you respond when you have problems with your wife? How do you respond when you have problems with your daughter? How do you respond when you have problems with other women at work? Do you play the blame game like we saw Adam do? Man, I don't blame God. She did this, right? Wow. Do, do you start calling her names? 
right? We've talked about that in in a couple of sessions here. The names for women really important. Adam named her woman, right? Now, boy, he's he's blaming everything on her. He's throwing her under the bus. Is that what you do to women? Do you try to use your your dominance to rule over her instead of trying to redeem the problem? You just want to establish that control, right? Man, hey, listen, guys, God never called us to respond to sin with sin. And you need to understand that problem of the wrestling between men and women, it's perpetual. It's it's part of living in distortion. So I want to introduce you very quickly to a policy change. So we go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. This is way back toward the back of your Bible. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And here comes your policy change in redemption. And we're going to talk a lot more about this when we get into that, that lighter section of our study. But listen to this. Instead of the wrestling and the ruling, right? The redemption says, 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Remember, that's what Adam did in Genesis 2. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We're going to talk more about what that means of her being the weaker vessel. It doesn't just mean that she's not as physically strong as a man is, but there's a preciousness to that being a weaker vessel. So hold on to that thought, and we'll get into that in a, in a later session. But man, instead of, of you as a man being hateful to her, show her honor. Instead of you trying to be her rival, understand her, right? Instead of you trying to rule over her, you're trying to, to understand her. Boy, this really plays into Ephesians chapter 5 that we're going to get into in a later session as well. But the woman as the weaker vessel, man, she is his equal, but she is not the same. That's true of every man and, and every woman, not necessarily in physical strength. There's some women that are more uh, they're physically stronger than men. There's a, there's a lot of women in the world who are a lot faster than me, who can run a lot further than me. Yeah, there's a lot of women who could, could beat me in a lot of different sports, right? There's women who are more intelligent than men. That's, that's not what he's talking about of being that weaker vessel, but he's talking about in general that men don't use that, that desire for dominance and that strength that they have to, to just wrestle back and rule a woman, but he's going to honor her and exist with her in an understanding way. So God puts this policy in place. And, and here's what he's telling you, guys. He, he And look at this. He says that your prayers may not be hindered. If your relationship is going to be right with God, it can't just be you and God. God puts it on, hey, your relationship's got to be right with your wife. You, you got to relate to women in the right way. If you don't relate to women in the right way, you hey, things aren't right between you and God. You have that responsibility. So we see the distortion that that sin brings into relationship with the woman. We see the policy change there. So now let's go into another one, and that is how sin has distorted man's relationship with creation. Guys, I think we can all agree, man, life's hard. In Genesis chapter 3 helps us to understand why it is so difficult. It raises the real possibility that a because of the curse, a man can work himself to death, make no difference, and return to dust. And I know every man that I'm I'm talking to, you felt that at, at different times. You mean like why am I doing all this? And I'm I'm just I'm working so hard, but it's it's making no difference. And and what we see in Genesis chapter 3, listen to the words, because you have done this, man, that goes to the serpent, that goes to the man, it goes to the woman. He tells him, man, you're going to feel the curse at home. You're going to feel the curse in your marriage. You're going to feel the curse in your relationship with women. You're going to feel the curse in your relationship in, in, uh, in with your work. He says, because you listen to the voice of your wife, you've eaten the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles. And gosh, guys, we can all speak of the things that just, it 
it just messes everything up. You worked so hard. You had it so right. You had the problem figured out. And it just thorns and thistles, right? Hey, listen, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. It is a real possibility that a man, because of the curse, he can work himself to death, make no difference, and just return to dust. But guys, there's hope. And you got to see this because if if that's where the Lord had left us, I think every man would have felt that. You know what, man? I just, I'm out here by myself and I ought to just give up. But God didn't give up on the first man and God isn't giving up on you. Because listen to this, Adam held, he heard something and all of that, ugh, the thorns and the thistles and the sweat of the brow and the curse of it all, he heard a ray of hope. Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the first mention of the gospel. God speaking to, the, the, to Satan. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Man, that's the first mention of the gospel. The redemptive sacrifice that Jesus is going to make of taking a wound for our sin. He's going to let Satan... Do his thing, and we're going to pay a price, or he's going to pay a price for us. But man, he overcomes Satan. He crushes his head in the end and brings about redemption. And Adam heard that. And when he heard that, it changed his heart. Remember in distortion, man, now he's he's blaming God. He's blaming her. But when he hears that ray of hope and, and his faith grabs onto it, his heart changes. Then the man, remember this, he, he names the woman in the beginning, and now he's going to name her again. The man called his wife's name Eve. He takes that responsibility back because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. We see that as the first act of salvation. Hey, the first man sinned, and the first man was saved. That can be the same story for you. God, God took the the clothing of fig leaves off of them, and he made a blood sacrifice. He clothed them with animal skin. Something that, that wasn't involved in their sin died for their sin. And we see this pattern established now all the way through Scripture. There must be, without the, re, re, uh, re, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's got to be a sacrifice. And so Adam grabs a hold of that hope. God gives him a future. He sends him out of the garden. And you know what? Even though it sounds like such a, a curse, it is, it is kind of an act of grace. It says that, therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. It, the job description doesn't change. He drove out the man to the east of the garden. He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword and turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. And you're like, man, he... Why didn't he give that back to us? And, and the Bible tells us this. I, I, I skipped one verse that, that I want you to hear right here. Verse 22. Remember how the Lord God said it's not good that man should be alone? Here's another one. Verse 22, chapter 3. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, dash. Now God saw something in distortion that wouldn't be good, that we would live forever like this, that we would live forever as badly behaving men, men that have a distorted view of women, men that have a distorted relationship with God, men that have a distorted relationship with creation. But God has given us a way. Yeah, we're going to return to the dust. And there's a lot of things, guys, in your life, they're just not going to work out the way you wanted them to. You're going to work so hard and... It may or may not make a difference, but you can't give up hope because God doesn't want us to always live like this. That's why we can't get back to the tree of life. But now our life is in Jesus Christ. Death is not going to be our end. Dust will not be, be our eternal status. Man, we are going to be raised again in Christ Jesus. And to be that man that has that hope, you got to you got to do what Adam shows. There's a heart change. He grabs on to the information that God gives him about this redeeming son. He, he expresses his faith in that hope, and he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to look at her different now. I'm going to look at life different now. I'm going gonna, 
and we'll take responsibility for where we are. And notice that Adam says, okay, if this is the life we got to live. I take responsibility for it. I'm going to keep working, but now I know I got to deal with some other stuff. Guys, that's really important. And he grabs onto that redemptive hope that he has in Christ Jesus. So that's the story, guys. Things were going really, really well until they weren't. And then there comes some policy changes in there. And so I hope that this kind of helps some of those lights to begin to come on for things to make sense. Guys, you still got a work to do. God still has a word for you. God still has a will for you. God still has women in your life that are that are supposed to be in a good relationship of y'all doing and working the will of God together, being helpful to one another. But hey, there is going to be this wrestling and all those things just... Kind of know when you are and kind of know why you are. And it helps us to understand better what's going on and to receive the, the gift of redemption. So ultimately, the question is this. Will you do what Adam did and put your faith and hope in what Jesus Christ, Adam believed in what he was going to do for him, but in what we know that Christ has done for us? And I want to tell you, as a man, it makes all the difference. It'll make you look differently at God. And instead of going into hiding, you, you'll take that cool of the day, the best part of your day, and you'll spend time with your Creator. It'll change the way you look at women. And you'll know the wrestling is there, and you become more self-aware of the problem. I, I, can't, just, I can't just try to win. I've got to seek to understand. And I, I've, got to, I've got to understand that she's a weaker vessel, and i got to treat her with honor instead of... Of, of just trying to be hateful toward her. And it'll make you look differently at creation. Yeah, work was bad last week, and work might be bad this week. But you know what? I still, I'm still going to eat bread. God's still going to bring about good. There's still going to be some things that, that do make a difference in my work. And that's all because of the redemptive work of God in my life. And so, guys, I would encourage you, as we get into this idea of distortion, grab on to that. So do your scripture readings, do your memorization this week. Now get together with some other men who are with you. And there's some questions down there for you. Work through those questions. Share one of your devotional times this week. It's going to be a good discussion.